Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. Here in just a moment, we'll continue our study through the Gospel of John. We are in John chapter 8, and we're going to be looking at the last two verses, verses 58 and 59, and then continue onward into John chapter 9. We'd like to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us for our study today. If this is maybe the first time you've joined the study, we want you to know that we'd love to hear from you. If you have any thoughts or comments as we go through the study, you can use the comment area that's connected with the live stream on Facebook or the chat area, which is connected with the live stream on YouTube. And uh, let us know what you have to think. If you would like to email us, you can also do that. Send it to questions at truthfactorlive.com. And we'll try our best to get to it during the course of the study. But if it's something that we miss, then we'll try to bring it back in at a future point in time. So we'd definitely love to hear from you. All right, let's see. Let's bring everyone into the study this morning. We have Bob and Brian and Tom with us. Uh, Paul is unable to be here. Brendan is unable to be here as well. Gentlemen, are y'all doing well? I'm doing well. All right, very, very good. good. Very good. Um, possibly Tom may have to bail on us a little bit, um, but we'll get his greatest thoughts of wisdom before that point, I am sure. <laughs> Um, let's see so far, the only one in the chat room that's chimed in is Caleb Davis. So Caleb, appreciate your being special enough to join us for our study today. Um, but if you haven't chimed in, but you are, uh, joining us live, please do that. Tell us if you're Bob from Minnesota or wherever you're from, we'd love to hear from you. Just let you, let us know where you're from. All right. So let's go ahead and I'm going to read. In John chapter 8, let's back up to just, uh, for just a few minutes, we'll back up to 54, jumping in, into the middle of the context here, and I'll read down to the end of the chapter, and then we can do some discussion real quick about verses uh, 58 and 59. So, verse 54 of John chapter 8, Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say, I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. The father, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Uh, going through the midst of them and so passed by. Okay. <clears throat> All right, let's bring everyone back in. I think the what we wanted to look at real quickly, we want to expound a little bit more upon his phrase, I am, and then maybe about him sneaking away, hiding from them in verse 59. So who wants to take a start that discussion on before Abraham was, I am. I think the thing we all go ahead, Brian. Go ahead, I think the thing we all the thing we all really like about this passage is it's a very straightforward declaration that Jesus is God. Um, probably most of our listeners understand that the Hebrew name for God, uh, which is translated into English as Jehovah, probably more accurately uh, in Hebrew Yahweh, was was an expression "I am," or more specifically, God. When he told Moses his name, he says, "My name is I am that I am." Um, and so this was a special name. It was so special that they couldn't pronounce it and they couldn't write it down. Um, that was their determination, by the way, not, not God's, just that they had said, you know, it was that special. Um, this was the covenant relationship. And by the way, I always like to kind of make the point to say that the covenant relationship for Israel was that God gave them his personal name. Our covenant relationship with God is that God permits us to call him father. So it's a, it's a better covenant for that reason. But it was a super special name. It's the name of God. So when Jesus makes this statement, it doesn't grammatically work. You know, you don't say I am whenever you're saying somebody else was, you know, you know, uh, before Abraham was, you would say I was. But I am is Jesus declaring he's God. And if we're not sure about that, verse 59, they decide to kill him for that. You know, that's uh, you, you wouldn't just say he just, it isn't just that he said something. <laughs> they're not grammar police. In other words, they're not just punishing him for. Uh, misstating something grammatically, they're punishing him because he has declared he's God. One of the unique things in the book of John is that that's one of the themes in the book of John, that Jesus is God. The very first thing we meet in John chapter 1 and verse 1 is that Jesus is God. 
And we have a number of statements in the book of John where Jesus makes an I am statement where he says, I am the good shepherd or I am the bread of life. I am, you know, the, these different expressions of I am throughout the book of John. We have seven of them total where Jesus takes that special name and, you know, makes a, uh, a compound word out of it with something else, you know, that he becomes uh, God, the good shepherd. He becomes God, the bread of life, you know, all these different ways of expressing his identity. Um, the other time that I am is used in a way that is like this is when Jesus is arrested in John chapter 18. And in John chapter 18, as they are arresting Jesus, they say, who are you? Are you Jesus? And then he says, I am. And when he says that, it knocks everybody to the ground. Um, that's always been one that's really struck me as, you know, a, a profound impact. So here's one of those profound impacts of the, of the declaration, I am. And then later on, when Jesus is arrested, you'll have a similar uh, proclamation. So that's why we really enjoyed this passage is because this verse is Jesus saying he is God. And it's a pretty, uh, a pretty profound, complex way of saying that he is God, but it's undeniable. Yeah. That was John 18, verse 6, that you referenced there. Now, when he said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. <clears throat> yeah. All right, that's a good point. Good point, Brian. Appreciate that. Would you make a connection between, <coughs> sorry, his name being I am, going back to what happened in Moses in Exodus chapter 3, and the third commandment, in Exodus 20, verse 7, not taking the Lord's name in vain. Do you think that's why they would not write? Or, I'm sorry, yeah. say his name out loud? Yeah, I do. I think that it was probably one of those ideas. And I don't think that, by the way, saying the name of God really was taking it in vain. I think we, I think we probably could all understand that God wasn't saying that. But it was one of those ways where they had created a barrier to the command so that they kind of surrounded the command with an extra command. You can't even say it or write it. And uh, that, that really wouldn't have been, as I said, I don't think that's an appropriate uh, idea right. on their part, but it, but it was trying to show a reverence to that. I've yeah. long thought that it meant uh, if you swear by God to do something, you do it. Otherwise you are forswearing yourself. In the Sermon on is, the Mount. Yeah, and that is what they were doing. If they took his name in vain, they would be forswearing God. But at the same time, to use God's name as a hiss and a byword, uh, that's, or a frivolous use of God's name, is sinful also. And uh, the only time we should use his name is when we're talking to him or about him. But... Okay, I don't want to dig this this hole any deeper because the can of the worms are starting to crawl out of it already. But is our word God? And you got to specify capital G because in our English language you differentiate between the two. Is that the name of God, or is that a term referencing Him? Like to Bob? me, it's a generic term referencing the one whom we worship. Yeah. It wouldn't be considered his name by, you know, by, by, by exactness, going back to what we see in the scriptures, but right, it would be, yeah. In the old Testament, yeah. Paul even mentions there are many gods in uh, yeah. what's that, Corinthians chapter eight. Uh, but, uh, there's only one true and living God. That's right. Yeah. That's the Godhead, including father, son, and Holy spirit. Yeah. It's interesting. Interesting. All right. Let's see. <clears throat> So it's good, good discussion there about I am, good explanation there of that. Any thoughts about verse 59? Then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them and so passed by. Anything supernatural with this? Or do you think he just, there's so big of a crowd that he was easily able to escape and I, get out I, undetected? I think that's the case. And some people may think, well, why didn't he trust God? Well, it doesn't indicate that he lacked trust in God. It was just that he came to die on the cross. He didn't, he didn't come to be stoned. It wasn't he didn't time. Come to be thrown off a cliff. Yeah. Uh, he came to die on the cross and that was going to be a while. Time had to be right for that. And, uh, and it eventually does come. 
Yeah. But uh, I think, yeah, he just uh, going through the midst of them. He it was a crowd. I don't know if you've seen the chosen or not, but it represents the the disciples of Jesus. You know, in a crowded Jerusalem street, and the streets were crowded. I mean, everybody was a pedestrian. Uh, no automobiles. Uh, mm-hmm. Carts were not generally used. Uh, they sometimes used, but almost everybody walked everywhere they went or rode a camel or a horse or something. But uh, right. <clears throat> it would be very easy to get lost in the crowd. Uh, Especially the crowd like, around him. Yeah, well, that's like going to a fair. Mm-hmm. I don't go to fairs because I don't do well in crowds, but uh, it's easy to get lost in a crowd. Yeah. And I think he did take advantage of that because it wasn't his time. And, and, and you know, when, when you talk about, a, uh, when you talk about uh, uh, did, why didn't he trust God, I think of the, I think of the temptations. But when Satan took Jesus up to the top of the t- temple, said, throw yourself down, and he even quotes, misuse the scripture, but God uh-huh. will take care of you. Why don't you test the, script, the, the system? Jesus didn't have to. He, he trusted God just because he didn't ask for a miracle doesn't mean he didn't trust God. Right. And and, and, and matter of fact, uh, you know, it, it seems pretty clear to me from Scripture that Jesus performed lots and lots and lots of miracles, but he never did them for personal purposes. You know, I mean, it, it wasn't about it was never about that. It was never really about him personally. It was it, about his yeah, exactly regarding his father yeah exactly and, and i do believe whenever whenever there is a natural explanation i think we ought to assume that to be the case now i have to say that with a caveat because <laughs> you know we know that there's the naturalistic bible believers or deists you know yeah. who think that god is always hands off and, and think that water to blood in egypt was it was actually red silt or, you know, and, and they, they try to find natural explanations for everything. No, I mean, I, God performs miracles, but we ought to, we ought to automatically, or we ought to assume the natural response in cases like this, uh, even Dreyer. though a miracle is possible. I'll come Dreyer. But when it is stated to be a miracle in God's word, we need to accept that. Absolutely. And that's the point. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that's the point. Like We're not Peter dismissing Peter. miracles. Like Peter or Philip being called away after baptizing uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. He was caught away by the spirit. Well, was that miraculous? I don't know. Uh, not necessarily. He was called away from uh, Samaria by the Holy Spirit. But was that a miracle? No. Well, the Holy Spirit speaking was a miracle, mm-hmm. but he still had to had to transport himself by his, you know, Pat and Bob, as we called it growing up, his two legs. And uh, there was nothing miraculous about his getting down there. Yeah. Yeah. All up. right. Any other thoughts before we go into chapter nine? Uh, I see Jimmy's got a comment or a question yeah. on Facebook. Uh, where he brought out John 14, verse 6, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the light. And then he went to Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, which is Jesus giving the Great Commission, and Jesus saying, I am with you always. And uh, then Jimmy <clears throat> asked the question, are those <clears throat> excuse me, are those parallel passages to this verse? Um, and Jimmy, my thought is, uh, I do think that the I am, particularly the one in John 14, at least maybe not parallel, but it is a complementary verse to this. This, uh, you know, that's one of those seven I am statements that are found where Jesus is is comparing those ideas. Um, and, and then in Matthew 28, that's an interesting catch to see the I am with you always, um, you know, could have a, a divine aspect to it. I hadn't really considered before. Sometimes I am... What's tricky about it is sometimes it's merely a conjugation of a verb, kind of like a, they do that in Spanish, where you know you you may not even need to say the I am, you just conjugate the word to it, um, and then sometimes it's very specifically inserted. I don't know how that works in Matthew chapter eight, uh, twenty-eight, uh, 
uh, 20. So um, uh, that that's an interesting question, and it probably needs some more research on my part. That is interesting. Uh, sorry about not catching that. I realized I hadn't turned on my Facebook comment feed and didn't realize it looking at the, the screen that, that there was none on there. So I appreciate the, that, catching that, Brian, there. Um, he's talking about where he says, at the latter part of 20, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Hmm, I know. Pretty good question. All right, any other thoughts or comments? <clears throat> All right, Mr. Bob, would you mind reading for us in John chapter 9? Let's read the first seven verses there. All right. Reading from the New King James. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no man, no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Therefore his neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, is not this who sat, he who sat and begged? Some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. He said, I am he. Okay. Blind. That'd be a good stopping point. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll get back to that here in a moment. Appreciate that, Bob. So Bob, I've, so in our conversation, when we're talking and we see someone out in public who's blind, we wouldn't, I don't think that we would naturally say in our culture, well, who sinned? This person or his parents, you know, who sinned to cause this blindness? But this seemed to be a common conception among people in the first century, among Jews, Jewish people, didn't it? Wouldn't they often it, connect illnesses with sin? That's right. Uh, as punishment from God. I mean, as far back as Job, I mean, uh, go back and read the book of Job. His three so-called friends were charging him with, at least one of them charged him with greater sin uh, than the others were because uh, you're being so punished, your sin must even be greater than we can perceive. Uh, but Job wasn't being punished for sin. He was being punished. It wasn't being punished at all. Uh, he was a test case between God and Satan. God chose him to show Satan that some men, at least, will trust in him, regardless of what they may get out of it uh, materially or physically. And and so I think that that's I think that does carry over here. They said, well, either he was he was some sin that he would commit. God said, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna let him be born blind. Or his parents had already sinned, I'm going to be causing him to be born blind. But, uh, and when Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents sinned, he doesn't mean they never sinned. But that that was not the cause of his blindness. Yeah. But he was blind as a, and I think this is a case of the providence of God. He was blind uh, so that uh, uh, the works of God should be revealed in him. And so God allowed this man to be born blind, and I believe allowed him to be in this place at this time where the Lord and his disciples would pass by and Jesus would have another opportunity to perform a miracle to demonstrate his power over the physical senses and demonstrate that he was who he said he was. Well, and even this type of miracle helped fulfill prophecies by Isaiah you know, the blind shall see, the yeah. deaf shall see. Yeah. Um, but Brian, do, do you think that there is sufficient? Now, I haven't asked him this question, so please forgive Brian if you don't have give good answer. Bob did good with that one. Um, do you think there's there's sufficient evidence in the scriptures to be able to draw a conclusion that that sometimes illnesses such as this, someone's born blind. 
could be a direct result of someone's sin as far as God punishing them through this means? Or do you think that's more of just the man's conclusion? So uh, that's a that's a really important question, and there, it's actually kind of complicated. We can start off by saying that back in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18, God had rebuked Israel for saying that if the parents ate sour grapes, the children's e teeth were set on edge, trying to say that there's an inheritance of sin. Um, there are false doctrines like original sin, sinful nature, total depravity, which try to say that the guilt of one person is imputed upon another total, totally wise, and that's a false doctrine for sure. <clears throat> now, um, that that sense can't be the case, uh, uh, but we might say that sometimes there are consequences to sin. Now, now I, I'll interject in here. The truth of the matter is there's only really one punishment for sin, and that's a big idea in the Bible. The wage of sin is death, being cut off from God. But there are consequences to sin. And that's the thing that makes this a little more murky in the answer, because there are consequences to sin that one person's sin can affect a lot of people. So Adam pays the wage of his own sin. The day he ate of the fruit, he died. But then a consequence of that is that he's cast out of the garden and death enters the world. And from that time on, all of Adam's descendants physically die. That's a consequence of Adam's sin. Um, if I were a drunk driver, you know, the, uh, being an alcoholic, being a drunkard is a sin. And if I'm driving down the road and I hit a car well, uh, as a drunk driver, I, I, I'm probably pretty convinced I'll inherit the wage of that sin, eternal death. But maybe when I hit that other car, that other person is injured or crippled or also killed. <clears throat> they're, they're receiving a consequence of my sin. Um, and the consequences of sin can be physical things. So it's not impossible that a man could be born blind as a consequence of his parents' sin. They, maybe they were drunkards or drug users. Or, you know, we've seen children born with all sorts of infirmities and such. And that could be the case. They could be a consequence of sin. But it's not a wage of sin. It's not the imputation of sin that's going on there. It's merely the fact that sin has lots of terrible consequences. The, uh, I could go further to say sometimes the consequences of sin aren't even there. Sometimes people don't even... Uh, experience the consequences of sin. I could get drunk and drive home and not have any kind of accident. Um, and and we understand that the consequences of sin are random and and they're not fair. And they're all you know that some people suffer them terribly and others get away without any kind of suffering. But the point is, is that in this case, uh, Jesus wants people to appreciate the idea that, that the wages of sin are only to the person that is inherited. And that has been God's rule from yeah. the beginning. That has been God's rule literally from the book of Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3, uh, and God has repeated it oftentimes being angry, uh, going so far as to rebuke Israel for ever even thinking that they might be punished for somebody else's sin. God doesn't punish, and again, let's let's appreciate that today there's only one punishment for sin, that is, that is to be cut off from God. God doesn't punish one person for another person's sin, uh, yeah. but God, but the consequence of sin <clears throat> can be broad and and various and and a lot of times we feel like a, a consequence is a punishment but it's not you know uh you know it, 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 I, if i'm a, if i'm a drunkard and i have an accident and i'm blinded or crippled i might feel like god is punishing me but but my punishment actually still waits me unless i can repent of it but in this case and i agree with what you said there i think that's a great distinction there a really great distinction but in this context here it's not so much a distinction of cause as they're, they're basically asking, is God punishing him because of a sin or someone else's sin? Yeah. But I, th I think it's a great explanation because throughout history, you've had people go through periods of time where they would look at someone's infirmity and just draw the conclusion, well, God is punishing you because of something you've done. And we would do that. Let's say we made a bad decision and now we're going through some challenges. We may want to say God's punishing us for what we did back then, but you're right. The wages of sin is death. Anything else that comes from that is going to be a consequence of what we've done or a cause of it. It's a good point. Good point. Uh, John, yeah, you know, also, also, don't forget the randomness of the world being the way it is because of sin. And, and what I mean by that is disease, <coughs> disasters, and so on. So I, I do believe that a lot of that hap would, not, would not be happening had Adam and Eve not sinned. You know, uh, uh, so I mean, but it's random. It, it, it's it's not God selecting a person and saying, "Okay, now this is this is punishing you," even though that can't happen. 
Um, um, but, but, uh, there's a thought that comes to my mind when Jesus says, neither this man or this parents. I said, I, I'm wondering, and, and I'm not fully convinced of this, that God said, you know what? I, I'm going to have this man born blind so that 30 years later, uh, Jesus can heal him and he can make his point. Uh, I, I, I think when when Jesus says but that the works of God should be revealed in him, I, I think that has more to do with the fact that at this time he is where he is at. He happens to be somewhere where he comes across Jesus. Jesus comes across him, and this becomes a teaching opportunity at this moment. In other words, I, I don't think God made him go through his life complete blind just so that Jesus could later on, many, many years later, Heal them. Uh, and that's just my thoughts on that. So you're not saying what Mordecai said. Who knows, but maybe perhaps you were put here for this moment. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. I believe Esther was. I mean, but but I see your point. It's yeah. not necess- There's nothing there to suggest or to prove that God caused this man to be blind for this moment. But it could be his position here. His The moment itself was for that purpose. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why. And, and, you know, even in the case of Mordecai with Esther, I mean, I mean, when Esther was being born or, yeah, when Esther was born, mm-hmm. did God already have it in mind? OK, this is the one I'm going to pick. Uh, this is the one I'm going to pick to deliver Israel 20 years later. You know, I mean, I mean, uh, we don't know that at some point God knew he was going to use Esther. And, and what's amazing about Esther is. It, it's one of only two books in the Bible that never mentions the name of God, but you can't you can't read a chapter of that text without seeing God. The hand of God. Work, yeah. You know, so. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Um, real quick, we got two. We have two comments I want to bring in. The first one is from Jimmy. He says, "Is the rabbi term when they you know they call Jesus rabbi?" The same as our rabbi term, which often refers to the Jewish faith. It is, I mean, it, it is a term, it's the same term, at least translated from Greek into our English language. It simply means teacher. Is that correct? That's that's correct. I think you find that early in John, uh, rabbi, which is teacher. <clears throat> I think and, rabbi also is master. I think some Bibles actually translate it. But it's, I don't think like Reverend, though, uh, although Jesus is Reverend, he's the only person ever, des- only person, human person ever des- deserve that title. Master, but, uh, teacher, yeah. Uh, I'm preacher Bob, I'm not pastor Bob. Pastor as a title wouldn't fit me because I'm not a pastor. And that's confusion in the religious world in general, not knowing the difference between a preacher and a pastor. <clears throat> I do. This is off topic, big time. Well, Jimmy brought it up, so we'll blame Jimmy for it. I do struggle with intentionally using some sort of term before my name to designate, you know, who I am. You'll you'll see a lot of people on YouTube. Well, I'm Pastor John. I'm Pastor So and So. Um, even saying I'm Preacher John, Preacher So and So, it's it's not really a title, and I don't think it should be a title. You know, and that's right. I was only using it as a descriptive term. Exactly. Yeah. And I do it. Now, sometimes I'll have brethren who will say, well, you know, they'll call me Pastor John. And, and I say, brethren, those who don't have as much Bible knowledge as say new to the faith. And since I do serve as an elder, I don't so much correct them per se, but I'll say, call me John, you know, yeah. um, just, just call me by my name. That's perfectly fine. And then they learn, you know, as time goes along and everything. Um, but it's a good question, Jimmy. Uh, but now, and, and, and it is the same idea, I think, in Jewish religion day, someone who's a teacher, it is the same. They would say showing him re- uh, respect, um, but it is, yeah. I think the closest, um, thing, the closest thing in our society would be uh, young people addressing older people as sir or ma'am. <clears throat> yeah, you it's almost gone. So, so little today. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they have no respect for their elders or they haven't been taught to respect their elders. And many times it's their own parents' fault because their parents will say, don't say ma'am to me. 
you yeah. know, and it's a younger generation of parents who think they are now old when their kids yeah. use the term ma'am and sir. Yeah. And uh, the other question friend instead of their parents. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, Caleb, he says, is the reason Jesus healed this way to show his ability to heal from afar? As in th this one, though, of course, being public. <clears throat> I think there were times Jesus healed from afar and it showed his, his, uh, his authority and his power. And it's the and, same authority power as here. And then since it was from afar, Jesus, no indication Jesus went to the pool of Siloam with him. Oh. And so he left it oh. up to him to fulfill the command. And it was only when he fulfilled the command that, that the power was actually effective. That was Caleb's point, wasn't it? It probably is. Because he told him to go wash at the pool of Siloam and yeah. Jesus d d doesn't even suggest he went with him to that. Because <clears throat> it says he went and washed and came back seeing. Yeah. Okay. I see that. That's a good point. Good point. All and right. Of course, Any? Every, mm -hmm. every example of Jesus healing somebody is different. <coughs> Pardon me. Is what? Uh, different. He didn't yeah. tell every blind person to go and wash in the pool of salt. Sometimes he just spat on the ground and, and they were healed by the clay itself. And, yeah. uh, and so, uh, you know, different, different things that were done that, uh, either demonstrated their faith or his power or both. Makes sense. Brian, any thoughts on that? Yeah, there's a, there's so much that's really interesting here. Um, first of all, I think that one of the things, so John nine is probably my favorite chapter in the book. Um, one of the reasons I like it so much is that Jesus is absent from a good big part of the chapter. I mean, basically, after verse 7, we're not going to see Jesus again till verse 35. And that term, see Jesus, is actually a big part of the theme of chapter 9. Um, the blind man doesn't see Jesus until he meets him in the end. And that's kind of a significant idea um, that it kind of plays into our own salvation. Jesus heals us. Uh, but because we've heard and believed and obeyed a command, uh, Bob said something kind of significant. This, this is truly an allegory to baptism, you know, go wash, you know, is the command. You don't see Jesus, but if you go wash, you have to have faith when you wash, you're healed. You know, this man wasn't healed the moment he believed, uh, he's healed the moment he obeys. He's healed the moment he washes. And so this is a a, a profound allegory to, to baptism, the command of Jesus, go do this. We have to believe it. You know, you have to, and then he goes to the pool and washes. And then later Jesus comes back. Um, by the way, what's kind of interesting is that this is one of the two times in the new Testament where Jesus looks for somebody, you know, verse 35 mm -hmm. will say, Jesus will hear this and go find him. And I, and I like to think again, that when Jesus knows that we've washed he'll come find us you know that when the day comes for him to return for us to be reunited he'll come find us this this whole thing is a is a profound testimony of the idea of, of salvation and 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 what is just really neat about it is this idea that that you know when they're going to interrogate him later what can he say he's never seen jesus you know he doesn't know who jesus is in that very personal way but he heard the word of jesus and obeyed it and that is us. I mean, one of the things in the book of John is that, you know, we're not going to see things, but we're still going to have to believe them. Um, John chapter 20 with Thomas, you know, blessed are those who don't, you know, who don't see, but believe, you know, that's faith. That's the idea of what's going on here. Um, the other thing is, uh, let me just add, you know, I'm, I'm just going to repeat Bob. I'm going to, I'm going to poke the dead equine, if you would, uh, because it really is, Bob said something real profound. Jesus can heal any way he wants. And what's really important to understand is that Jesus never has to say, well, I have to ask my father to do this, um, not, and not, not in a submissive way. I don't mean that, it, that he's not submissive. But I mean the, the demonstration that Jesus heals people so many different ways is a demonstration that Jesus could do it any way he wants because it's his power. Uh, he doesn't say, Father, stop the storm. He commands the storm to be stopped. And when he says that, everybody knows, you know, only God could actually make the command that nature has to obey. Jesus could heal people like the, you know, we mentioned the, you know, the centurion, you know, that he says, I don't even have to go to your house, you know, to heal him, uh, you know, because I'm God. This is an I'm God kind of thing where Jesus, and, and Bob says something really important. Jesus doesn't have to go to the pool of Siloam. By the way, I have a picture of the pool of Siloam, but I can't share my screen. I was going to, I was going to throw it up there. Pool of Siloam is an archaeological site. They found the pool of Siloam. So it's kind of neat that 
um, that that's one of those testimonies of the Bible that's uh, out of the Bible that we see to be true. But it's um, but it's important to understand that, like Bob said, Jesus doesn't need go because he doesn't need to go. This man just needs to believe Jesus. And if he washes away, uh, you know, and you have to wonder, you know, I'm going to get up and, and that's not an easy thing. You're blind. You got to, okay, I got to find my way to the, uh, maybe I have to have somebody lead me there. Um, why believe Jesus? If you don't really know who he is, well, you know, you want to be saved. You want to be healed. You, you know, there, you know, something about Jesus. There's just a lot in this story that's really remarkable. And, and the best things are going to be as this blind man. And, and remember blindness and sight are also in their language and in our language, allegories for understanding. You know, if I see something, I understand it. That's going to be the language in this chapter too, that, you know, about understanding and seeing. And Jesus is even going to tell the Pharisees at the end, you know, you guys are the blind ones because you can't see something. Um, last comment. I, well, actually, no, I'll, I'll save this one for later. So I'm done. <clears throat> All right. So let me get called up here. I was going to try to see if I can also share <clears throat> a... Um... I found a picture. It may or may not be in the one that you were talking about. Let's see if it'll go over to um, the captured. It doesn't look like it did. I went completely black screen on all of us. Yeah, we can see it. We can it. see it, John. I've got it on my laptop. Okay. Y'all yeah, can, can see it. But it. The, and, and, y'all and y'all can see it, but the Solo. folks at home can't. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> um, I've messed up my I messed up my VMix. Hang on just a second. <laughs> Um, what did I do here? Turn off that. Okay. So what I try, uh, just a minute, guys, people at home well, saying we're still seeing the black screen. Facebook, post that on our Facebook page. Yeah. Yeah. That would be a good idea. Hang on just a second. I need to correct this. So I tried to do something funny, Brian, when you, cause you, you wouldn't be able to see what I did when you started referencing Bob and giving him credit. I put Bob's lower third up there while you were talking. And then when you went to your own words, then I put your lower third back up there. All right. <clears throat> yeah. Um, <clears throat> good point. Good point there. The, you know, oh, that's what it was. I, I hadn't really made that connection. At least I don't remember making the connection. The fact that the blind man did not know what Jesus looked like. All he would have yeah, known was his voice, you know? And then when he went and washed and came back, Jesus was probably, was already gone away from that area. Yeah. And which by the way, it's kind of neat that, uh, in John 10, Jesus would say, my sheep know my voice, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and which, which, which is a follow up of this conversation. It's a continuation. So it's kind of neat. Yeah. And you know, I think we need to complete verse five there. As long as I am in the world. I am the light of the world. Yep. Now that light has dimmed somewhat because we are a mere reflection of that light to whatever extent we manifest faith in God and demonstrate the characteristics that he wants us to demonstrate, uh, godliness, etc. And so Jesus transposed that to us in the, uh, sermon on the Mount. You are the light of the world. Yeah. We could not be if he wasn't already. Yeah, that's a good point. <clears throat> Hang on just a second here. I'm trying to do one thing real quick. I uh, don't want to take too long with this. I want to bring that, the, um, the pull back up here. I think we can do that without much trouble. Had I, I had had a module set up for that very purpose. And then I had deleted the module because, well, we just never shared anything like that. <laughs> Brian says, hey, let's show a picture. <clears throat> okay, well, we'll work it out later. It's no big deal right now. Um, <clears throat> actually, just search Google, search for Pool of Siloam, and you'll find some really good images there of that. All right, let's see. All right, let's see. What time is we? We have 11.42. We have a few more minutes remaining. Um, <clears throat> oh yeah, this, this was it. Sorry. So when, when he comes back, the people obviously can tell that, I mean, they're so shocked by what they see that their eyes tell them this guy, this is the guy who was just previously blind, 
But some of them weren't believing their own eyes. This is not this he who sat and begged. Some said this is he. Others said he is like him. And then the beggar himself, the blind man, said, I am he. Okay. Now, in this case in point, he's identifying who he was. I'm the one that you're talking about. You know, I am the one who was blind, but now I can see. <clears throat> this so would be an example mm -hmm. of what Brian said earlier, conjugation. Yes. Yeah. He's not, claiming, he's not making a claim Jesus just made. <clears throat> yeah, that's right. You all apologize when I tried to bring up the pool of Siloam. I took, I grabbed a picture of it at nighttime. So that's why it was all black and you couldn't see anything. It was a nighttime picture of the pool of Siloam. <laughs> you need to find a daylight picture. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Caleb said, I see black. And so that told me that, you know, that would be my, my, my limited excuse for my, my mess up there. <clears throat> okay. Brian, if you would, let's continue in verse 10. And um, I should have had Bob. Sorry, I, I probably stopped you. I didn't. I didn't look far enough ahead. I think we, in the I reading think we stopped at verse eight. Yeah, I think we stopped. Uh, so I need to start at verse eight. Or yeah, go ahead. Go I, ahead. Get us get us back into it a little bit. We've talked a little bit about eight and nine. Go ahead and start at eight and bring. Yeah, us down yeah, we did. Uh, we did. I'm sorry, but uh, um, where uh, John? I messed you up. Tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it. Let's read to verse I'll twelve. Do. All right. Uh, I'll start back at verse 8 again. Therefore, his neighbors and those who previously had seen him, uh, mm -hmm. seeing that he was the blind man, said, Is this not he who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. He said, I am he. Therefore, they said to him, How were your eyes open? He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay, anointed my eyes, and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. Okay. <clears throat> so he, he knew, at least he knew the name of Jesus. Yeah. He, he knew the name of the one who did this. And he recounted very faithfully what Jesus had done and the result of what Jesus had done. And answering their question, honestly, he did not know where Jesus was. Okay. All right. So let's continue in verse 13, Brian, if you just keep reading. And, um, this is a little bit. How, where longer. would you like me to go to? That's what I'm trying to decide. This is kind of an unbroken section. But let's go ahead and start with verse 13. And um, give me the whole thing. How far is the whole thing on your end? <clears throat> well, it looks like to me it goes all the way to 34 in one conversation. Yeah. So. Let's, let's stop in verse um, 16. All right. So 13 yeah. to 16. Yeah. They brought him who, who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now, it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes, and the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put clay on my eyes, and I washed and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. He said to the blind man again, What do you say about him because he opened your eyes? And he said, He's a prophet. The Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him uh, who had received his sight. I'm sorry, you said through verse 18 or 16. Keep going. Sorry. You're on a roll. Okay. Uh, they asked him, saying, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered him and said, we know this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He's of age. Ask him. He'll speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was a he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. I'll stop here. Okay. Yes. A good point. Good stopping area there. All right. <clears throat> to me, this I really enjoy this particular reading because of the way the parents, a little bit fearful, obviously, but the way they handle the situation here. But now, you know, they had to have known when I mean, they, the Jewish leaders here, they had to have known this was Jesus. Okay. It's almost like they're looking for some sort of self-incrimination or something because in verse 16, they said, uh, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath talking to man about the man who healed the blind man. And that's been one of the biggest issues they've had with Jesus. They ignore the miracles done before them. Their problem is he does it on the Sabbath day. 
and they perceive it as work, and they perceive that he does not observe the Sabbath day. But then another question was opposed. How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. Who were they talking about? Jesus? Yeah. And the sin. I mean, Go ahead. How, if Jesus is a sinner, why would God work through him to, to give this blind man sight? Could the sin be him not observing the Sabbath? Do you think they're making that direct oh, connection? Yeah. That's, that, that's what the Pharisees are saying. Yeah. The, the Pharisees, they did not make a proper distinction between uh, working uh, and and helping yeah. people. Even Jesus made this Congress made this distinction later on. Is it which if you're having a uh, an ox fall in a ditch on the Sabbath day wouldn't try to get him out. And of course, this has led many to uh, excuse themselves from Sunday services by using the uh, the metaphor, well, my ox was in the ditch. Yeah. If you use that often enough, sooner or later, you're going to have to sell the ox, fill the ditch, or put up a fence. Yeah. <laughs> Stop <laughs> the problem. There. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> yeah, they definitely viewed him as a sinner because he did not, quote, keep the Sabbath. Yeah. But he did keep the Sabbath. He never sinned. We know that. But they weren't ready to admit that. But they, they were even divided, though, on how to That's deal right. with the situation. They were divided there on, on how they should view it. Um, so, Brian, they, they asked the fella, what do you say about him? And his answer is real simple. He's a prophet. Yeah. That's, it's obvious. Anybody could see it. Yeah. That he's a prophet. <laughs> yeah. He would have to be, you know, yeah. at least in this yeah. man's mind's eye for him to, no pun intended, in, oh. the, in his eyes. Um, the only way that he could possibly be healed is if Jesus was yeah. a prophet. Yeah. And he's going to say something profound uh, coming a little further <clears throat> on there uh, in verse 32. And it pertains to something significant about the nature of this particular miracle. And Bob alluded yeah. to it earlier. Um, the Old Testament, when it said the Messiah would come, it said, and and I love this part of the story. It said that when the Messiah came, he would open the eyes of the blind. He would make the lame walk. He would uh, get the mute to speak. And that's actually what we would call a messianic miracle, a miracle that the Messiah is going to perform. But I'm going to pause for a second. I'm going to say that the blind man is reminding us only the Messiah performs. In other words, there have been lots of miracles in the past, and we've seen people even raised from the dead, but the blind man reminds us, you know, nobody's ever got their sight back. Uh, you know, you could also add to that the lame walking and the, and the mute speaking. When Jesus does those miracles, those are miracles that the Old Testament prophets said, hey, you know how you're going to know the Messiah? When this guy comes and he opens the eyes of the blind, you know that's the Messiah. And the blind man is saying... Who else could it be? He did the thing the Messiah is supposed to do, you know, and that's never happened. That, that's something that's not, you know, in our history, that this is not something we've ever heard of. That uh, I mean, we've had people that were bl blinded by God and given their sight back, but we've never had somebody born blind, got their sight back. That was the Messiah's work. So who else can he be? You know, this is going to be his conclusion here in just a few moments. He, who does he have to be? I mean, this miracle wasn't just... Uh, a miracle like something happened it was a messianic miracle it was a it was a identifying miracle of the messiah yeah. and the blind man is thinking about that that's that's kind of what's underlying his conversation here and he obviously then had the old testament in braille <clears throat> <laughs> i do wonder uh, bob how does he know that that's the case but he's right i mean he knows a couple of things about the old testament he'll say told him probably yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, I mean, like I said, it's kind of interesting. His parents that we meet must have been godly enough to have told him what the Bible said, you know, um, because he makes a couple of Old Testament claims, verse 31 being another one uh, that is a that is a teaching of the Old Testament. So he's a knowledgeable guy. He's not a, he's not a rocket science. And what I love about this story is, hey, guys, I don't know a lot, but what I do know is enough for me to say I know who Jesus is. It's yeah. common sense. Common sense with the biblical knowledge yeah. being the under yeah. foundation. Yeah. Well, but this is what Jesus uh, told John's disciples. Go tell John 
that the blind see and yeah, the deaf hear yeah. and so forth, you know. Yeah, right. He quotes that. He quotes one of those prophecies. You're exactly yeah. right. That's that's the big yeah. thing to John. Um, and the dead live or something like that. They're, you know. And Jesus All right, so, read mm -hmm. from that uh, in the synagogue from Isaiah. Yes. He read, uh, yeah, Isaiah 61. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Luke yeah. chapter four. All right. Let's see. Let's go a little farther here. So. So the, we read about their conversation with the parents, and their parents basically say, you ask him, he's of age. So it kind of gives us a little bit of an indication of his age. He is of age, old enough to answer for himself. And so um, let's start with verse, we, you read through 23, didn't you, Brian? I did. I did. All right. Let's pick up in verse 24, and I'll read down through, well, I'll pick a stopping point there. So here we go. So they again called the man who was blind and said to him, Give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. Then they said to him again, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Oh, don't say that. <clears throat> then they reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, Why? This is a marvelous thing, that you do not know where he is from. Yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he can do nothing okay <clears throat> um there's a lot of interesting points here and and y'all have already touched on some of these of course as we go through here but the the man's observation is real simple i don't know whether or not this guy is a sinner but i know i was blind and now i can see and he'll go that, on to say or go ahead, Bob. <clears throat> that does not mean he hasn't drawn some conclusions right but his personal <clears throat> knowledge is it zilch about he doesn't know anything about Jesus. Yeah. Except that he healed his bl blindness. Exactly. But, yeah. But he has concluded that Jesus is a prophet. Yeah. And um, they ask him again. He says, I've already told you. But his question, you know, are you interested because you want to become one of his disciples? And I, th I think that's kind of using their, their kind of uh, arguments against him because Back in John chapter 7, when Nicodemus says, uh, shall we judge him without hearing him? Well, are you from Galilee? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. you got to turn that on them a little bit there. Yeah. Uh, we see their high defense. Of, they got their defensiveness. You are his disciple. We are Moses's. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. And then the guy basically says, why do you not know where he's from? You know, look at this marvelous thing. What is the only conclusion we can draw? Now, that's my wording of it, but that's kind of the point. He has opened my eyes. Where must he be from? Now, we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Now, this is a, let, let me keep it to the point here for just a second. This is the conclusion that he's drawn. Okay. God doesn't hear sinners. And we've never seen anyone do this before. So therefore, this man must be from God and must not be a sinner. That seems to be the conclusion he's drawing. Is that correct? Yeah. Kind of in his the reasoning there. And the marvelous thing to me here is not the miracle, but the fact that they do not yeah. uh, know where he is from. Yeah. They willingly the were blind to him. You don't know where he is from, yet he healed my sight. Yeah. Uh, and he oh, concludes, God. if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I think that's a big, important point that kind of connects back to something Bob said earlier. Bob took us back whenever they were debating with Nicodemus, and they were mm -hmm. saying, where is he from? That's That's been the big question of the book of John. Where is Jesus from? Yeah. Of course, it, back when they're debating with Nicodemus, it's about, is he from Bethlehem or Nazareth? But the, the theme of the book of John is, he is from heaven. That's where he's from, and he is from the Father, and he is God, and that's 
uh, again, you know, where is he from, you know, is <clears throat> is the debate. And and this and, and their answer to the debate, by the way, is anybody who who declares this gets thrown out. Um, by the way, I, I sometimes congregations say, hey, we've got a controversial issue here. So our our decision is just don't talk about it. Um, that doesn't work. You know, that that ends badly, as case in point here is you, you, you're you never going to solve a problem by saying we're not going to talk about it. Yeah. Um, they, they, there was a real contention here though. And that's, that's actually critical to what we're reading about is that they've made this choice. You, you say that Jesus is the Christ, you know, and, and that's gotta be what they're looking at Nicodemus for earlier. Nicodemus, are you one of his people? Are you know, are you, oh no, you know, I'm, I'm a disciple in secret. You know, several of these guys are called secret disciples because they don't want to make this public confession and get cast out. <clears throat> yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, then the, there's I've got one one thing I want to talk about real briefly. Come back to this here in just a second. Um, but they said to him in verse 34, uh, you were completely born in sin and are you teaching us? And they cast him out. They come back to the question, well, clearly you were born in sin because you were born blind. You know, and here you are, you're, you're trying to teach us. Do you think verse 31 has ever been misused by a preacher? I, now we know I that God don't. does not hear sinners. <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to pause for a second and say, I think that the generic application, and, and, I'm, and I'm looking for you to disagree, um, I think it's appropriate to say that this statement is a axiom. Um, okay. and, and the reason I say that, sometimes people will point out and say, well, wait a second, was this guy really inspired as he's declaring this? And my answer is, this is an Old Testament axiom. This is a statement that's found mm -hmm. all through the Old Testament, that God... Mm -hmm. If you're not right with God, God's not going to listen to you. God's not going to pay attention to you. So, so I know that sometimes we kind of point out and say, well, you know, um, there are exceptions to this. Yeah, there are, you know, especially as we try to define the idea of sinner. But the point is, if you know, that that God's God's committed response to a person, and 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 in this case, hears him is the connection of Jesus to the Father, or the connection that we would say of a Christian to God. To hear us is to to have a great deep care for us, consideration, to be mindful of us. That's the conversation context. And I think, and I know where you kind of go with this, John, because, you know, like I said, there, there are some problematic aspects of this. And Cornelius is probably one of the best examples of, you know, well, you know, God's listening to Cornelius, but Cornelius isn't right. But Cornelius is a worshiper of God. Uh, he's a man who fears God and does his will, although he doesn't know the will of Christ yet. So, I do think there is a truth here that is worth repeating. And and you'll hear the preacher at my congregation say this one a lot. He'll say John 30, uh, 9, 31 a lot because he'll say this is a this is a summary statement yeah. of a whole bunch of Old Testament truths. So so it's interesting you point that out. And I like, I like to kind of say I do think we're okay to say John 9, 31 because this is a summary of the totality of the Old Testament's commentary on it. At the same time, when I was in the insurance business, uh, I went around collecting uh, premium <clears throat> uh, on a debit, and uh, I made it a point to set up a, a, a Bible study with two ladies. One of them didn't pan out, but the other one did. And we had a long study of God's Word. And she eventually was baptized into Christ, and where she attended, her Bible class had this discussion on whether God hears sinners and said, you know, God does not hear a sinner's prayer. And she says, now don't tell me that. Cause I, I used to be praying for God to send me somebody to help me understand the Bible. And he sent brother my hand. <laughs> there, there, there's and other God aspect. Did, God did send me, not in the sense yeah. that he called me verbally, but yeah, that was the responsibility I had from reading God's word. How, uh, you know, that, and that opens up another discussion there. I mean, we be, we have to believe that God that God works in the lives of individuals, even if someone's not a Christian. If they're seeking to know the truth, yeah. If jump forward thirty years, they'll say, "I thank God for brother so and so coming into my life." Well, how did brother so and so get into your life? Had to be yeah. by the will of God, you know. Um, and I actually. I don't think that necessarily contradicts what John 9.31 yeah. is saying, because he says to do God's will is the, what is the first thing God requires of any sinner to listen mm -hmm. to it, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because, Bob, I've heard a lot of people make this statement just like you did to say, hey, you know, I wanted to know God. And then 
God brought this person. Well, I think the idea is, you know, they wanted to do God's will. They wanted, and the first step of wanting God's will is wanting to listen to God. And so I think I think there is a sense where John 9, 31 even fits that context to say that the, the, the sinful person who wants to do God's will, maybe God will hear what they're saying, you know, that maybe and God I, will do that. And I do use the idea when it comes to praying for salvation, apart from doing his will. And somebody's saying, well, I prayed to God to save me, and I believe he did. Well, did you obey him before he saved you? Uh, what do you mean? <laughs> did you repent? Uh, what's that? <laughs> Were you baptized? Well, no, I've never been baptized. And how do you know he forgave you? I just feel it in my heart. Yeah. Um, a similar to Jesus' statement in John 3, 5, whoever does the will of my father is my brother and my sister and mother. Does, does the will of my father. So, Brian, I'll tell you why I asked the question. It wasn't really so much about whether or not God hears sinners, okay? But whether or not... This is an authoritative statement to quote. The Bible, preachers will say, well, the Bible says God does not hear sinners. So the question is, where does it say that? Okay, John 9, 31. Who said this? All right, we're assuming an uninspired man who's trying to convince the Pharisees that Jesus healed him because even the Pharisees knew, and, and I liked your explanation based on looking at back the Old Testament, it was typically understood that God would not hear sinners. The only time he heard Israel when they walked away is when they repented and called back for him. You know, So I think the statement in and of itself is true, but is it as authoritative in the text here as Peter on the day of Pentecost, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins? You know, it's, it, I'm we, kind of splitting hairs. So it's, you know. We can say the same thing about about a lot of statements in the Bible. Yeah. The fact that a statement is in the Bible does not mean that statement is true. It is true that the statement was made, but was the statement true? Look at the lies uh, represented or told by the, again, quote, friends of Job. They were not, yeah. they were arguing against God as well as against Job. And, uh, and, God said, you know, Job, I want you to offer a sacrifice for these men because they've sinned against me. And so you can't just quote those guys and say, see there, it's in the book. It's in the Bible. Yeah, yeah, but it was a man who was not inspired that said it. So Bob Myhan says there are uninspired statements in the Bible. That's Bob at truthfactor.com. No, <laughs> it's not what he's saying. But, but you're right, though. Not every statement in the scriptures was stated by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The record That's right. would have been recorded by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But the statements in of itself were people talking. Yeah, Genesis 3, you've got Satan quoted, mm -hmm. or the serpent. Yeah, uh, yeah. Was what the serpent said true? No. No. Is it true that the serpent said it? Yes. Yeah. It's true that the serpent said it because Moses didn't lie. Exactly. It was not true because the serpent said it. All right, we are at the end of our time. So let's plan next Thursday. Let's go ahead and pick up with verse 35, where Jesus now finds the individual, um, having heard that he's kicked or cast out of the uh, synagogue there. And Jesus finds him and begins his conversation with him. And that'll put us at John chapter 9, verse 35. Sounds good? Sounds good. All righty. Well, listen, we want to thank everyone for joining us uh, today for our study. We'd like to thank you for being here as well. Again, if you have any thoughts or comments you want to share with us, send them to questions at truthfactorlive.com. You can send them there um, or send uh, email to us individually, john at, paul at, tom at, et cetera, truthfactor.com. And um, we will definitely receive those. Well, that's it. We'll continue our study again next week, John 9, verse 35, next Thursday at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time. And again, appreciate all your participation. Gentlemen, it's good to see you. And we'll see everyone again next week. Have a wonderful week you. now.
Okay. In this case, this man no 